Cornell West. I'm sure most of you are familiar with his brilliant and highly influential work. Dr. West is one of America's most prominent public intellectuals, known for books like Race Matters and Democracy Matters, and for appearances on CNN and Democracy Now. He's currently a professor of the practice of public philosophy at Harvard University. And he's even released a few spoken word albums, one of which I really enjoyed, Sketches of My Culture. I was beyond excited when Dr. West agreed to speak at this event. I've admired his moral courage and eloquence for years. In fact, I remember hearing him speak in this very space last year for Black History Month. He electrified the room with a call to end the spiritual blackout that exists in America today and festers apathy to the suffering of others. So it's no surprise that Dr. West is here tonight standing in solidarity with Yemen and to speak about peace in U.S. foreign policy. Please welcome Dr. Cornell West. What a blessing to be here, what a blessing to be at Yale University, New Haven, Connecticut, to stand in solidarity with our precious brothers and sisters in Yemen. I want to begin by saluting the young brothers and sisters here at Yale. Where is Brother Diaco? Oh, there he is. He's in the back here. Amo, Mimi, all of them. Give it up for the young folk here at Yale University who are standing in the best of the legacy of Yale of light and truth. And there is no light unless it struggles to emerge out of darkness and the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak. And there is no way to describe the eloquence, the courage, the vision, the sophistication rooted in sensitivity to suffering of the address we have just heard from my dear sister, Professor Dr. Shereen uh, Adima. Give it up for her. send a message here in Connecticut, in America, and around the world. We want to be very clear and we want to be candid that a precious baby in Yemen has exactly the same value as a baby in New Haven. That a precious baby in Yemen has the same value as the Babel in Chicago, in Guatemala, in Ethiopia, on the West Bank, Tel Aviv, China, Japan, or Korea. We want a moral and spiritual awakening around this issue in such a way that people can see that we're willing to pay a cost. We're willing to bear a burden to ensure that this suffering that we saw in this video is alleviated, is attenuated, and yes, it has everything to do with the Socratic legacy of Athens and the prophetic legacy of Jerusalem. So I come before you tonight, again saluting each and every one of you who takes this time out. This is really the first real spring day of the year, I understand that. So it's a challenge in that regard. But we know we have higher concerns, higher ideals, as it were. And to have our young brothers and sisters here at Yale University, very much like the students at Yale and other places in 1965 when they cast a limelight on what was going on in Vietnam. 
or in the 1980s when you cast a limelight on what was going on in El Salvador and Honduras and Nicaragua or in the 1990s we cast a limelight on what was going on in South Africa so it is today 2019 we've got young people at Yale who are on fire for light and for truth and for justice motivated by a deep love but tied to a Socratic sensibility in which they're trying to get us to think more critically about ourselves about Yale about America about the world so this is a very special evening here in the history of Yale and I want you all to know that that people will look back next year next year after the issue of the suffering in Yemen becomes more and more visible and salient and undeniable and inescapable and the challenge we have is to ensure it has moral substance and spiritual content such that the political consequences are such that it's rooted in our concern about that particular place but is connected to places all around the world in every corner of the globe so there's a universality rooted in the particularity of this suffering. So I want to begin very briefly by acknowledging first the ways in which this night is rooted in the Socratic legacy of Athens. Yes, we plan to raise some Socratic questions, unsettling questions, unnerving questions, unhousing questions. And any time in the history of America, you introduce within the discourse catastrophe, you are unsettling. Because we in America tend to be obsessed with philosophical forms of pragmatism in which we view ourselves as problem solvers. No, we're not going to confuse the catastrophic with the problematic. There's not a problem in Yemen. There's catastrophe visited on Yemen. And that's always an intellectual challenge. Because I come from a people who've been terrorized for 400 years. It is no such thing as a Negro problem. It was a catastrophe visited on black people. White supremacist slavery, American terrorism and lynching. No such thing as a woman's problem. Catastrophes visited on women. No such thing as a working class problem. Catastrophes visited on working class people. No such thing as a Jewish problem in Europe. It was a catastrophe visited on Jewish brothers and sisters. Do we have here at Yale University the courage and capacity to wrestle with catastrophe? The category is so easily deodorized and sanitized and sterilized. And I come from a people who love to keep it funky. <laughs> Real funky. Tied to the catastrophic. My dear brother, Aaron Gaston, Distinguished Dean at Yale knows what I'm talking about. James Venable sitting right next knows what I'm talking about. That's what it is to be a blues people. The blues is catastrophe lyrically expressed. Strange fruit, says that genius from Baltimore City, Billy Holiday. Strange fruit that southern trees bear, black bodies swaying in the southern breeze. That's catastrophe. And how do we come to terms whether the first thing you do is not deny it, not avoid it, not evade it. You have to confront it. And the best of the Socratic legacy of Athens understood that. This is why Plato used to say, the love of wisdom, philosophy, philosophy is a meditation on and a meditate and a confrontation with death, with forms of death. It could be social death, civic death, psychic death, spiritual death, or physical death. Do we have what it takes to confront 
the various forms of death operating among our brothers and sisters in every corner of the globe, but especially tonight as it relates to our priceless brothers and sisters in Yemen. Yes, that is the best of the Socratic legacy of Athens that says, as we raise these questions, we're gonna distinguish between paideia, P-A-I-D-E-I-A, -E deep education, not that cheap schooling that's just about skill acquisition and information, but rather deep education that's about transformation, it's about awakening, it's about changing oneself so that Socratic self-examination and self-reflection goes hand in hand with self-transformation so we emerge with more power, more vision, more courage, more critical sensibility as we come together so that our solidarity has real content and substance to it but most importantly it has that moral and spiritual content yes I am a footnote to a rich tradition of a people who've been chronically and systemically hated for 400 years and yet at our best Black people have taught the world something about love and how to love. Just turn on John Coltrane to Love Supreme and sit down and see how it feels over in deep solidarity with what we saw of those precious folk in this video. Or Martin Luther King Jr.'s love ethic. Or the love in Malcolm X. And it was hard for Vanilla brothers and sisters to keep track of the love in Malcolm because he was hard in his first stage on white brothers and sisters, wasn't he? And he acknowledged he was wrong. He said, oh, they're devils. No, I'm wrong. They just still have too much devilish behavior. But the love had to do with his love for those who were catching hell. And that was an articulation of a certain kind of love ethic, love ethos. The Isaac brothers call it a caravan of love. And that love is not just of neighbor, but it's of truth, of goodness, of beauty. And for those of us who are religious, like my dear brother who is so exemplary in terms of his rich spirituality, Imam Bajwa. Love you, my dear brother. It has to do with the love of God, love of the holy. But how do you make that connection between the love of the holy, the love of beauty, the love of goodness, the love of truth? Be you secular, agnostic, and atheistic, or be you religious, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, polytheistic, traditional indigenous people, whatever your religious orientation, do we have what it takes to be unsettled in such a way that we open up our minds and hearts and souls and have the kind of solidarity required to attenuate the suffering? Empire in the United States denied from the beginning of its history to this moment. Look at the US Constitution, not just no reference to the institution of slavery, but the reference to indigenous peoples, empire of liberty to dominate the savages. The notion that somehow the American empire begins with the sub subordination of eight million people of color in the 1890s in Cuba, in Guam, in Samoa, in the Philippines. No, to go from 13 colonies to 35 is already internal imperial expansion. They call it manifest destiny. There's another deodorized category. Sanitized, sterilized, losing sight of the suffering, the scars and bruises of our precious indigenous brothers and sisters. There is no way to understand U.S. presence in Yemen without taking seriously the category of empire. 
the very notion at this very moment, 4,887 military units sponsored by the U.S. government around the world, 587 in other parts of the world, 128 countries have U.S. special operations taking place. No talk of it, of any seriousness in the public discourse, let alone corporate media. Thank God for Sister Amy Goodman. Give it up for Sister Amy. Give it up for Sister Amy. Somebody's going to talk about it. Thank God for Black Gender Report, Glenn Ford. And thank God for Jumu Baraka, Alliance for Black Alliance for Peace, Margaret Kimberly, and some of the others trying to keep track of the imperial legacy at work. And yes, it begins with moral sensitivity. Yes, it begins with spiritual sensibility. But if we don't have an analytical understanding of the way in which America is an empire and the way in which it attempts to reproduce its geopolitical interests and its financial and corporate interests around the world, we're not gonna understand how we should engage in critique and resistance to what's going on in Yemen. And that is a formidable challenge because it means that prevailing paradigms of understanding and the frameworks in place must be radically Socratized, called into question. And that's why the students here at Yale, bearing this magnificent moral and spiritual witness, are raising some deep intellectual challenges to the curriculum here at Yale, to the faculty and teaching here at Yale, to the dialogues here at Yale, and then acknowledging the ways in which in the early part of the 21st century, empire becomes inextricably interwoven with Islamophobia with the fear of Islam, the attempt to demonize our precious Islamic brothers and sisters. Edward Zaid was right. Oh, what a powerful public intellectual he was in the latter part of the 20th century. Princeton undergrad, Harvard PhD, over 44 years of teaching at Columbia and writing that Orientalism, the question, question of Palestine covering Islam. How could it be that lo and behold, the articulation of American empire is such that is no longer simply the subordination of indigenous people. It's no longer simply making Latin America the, the playground for corporate interests in the state. Now it's tied to this Islamophobia. And yes, we must be critical of all groups, no matter what color, no matter what ideology, no matter what political orientation, when it has to do with killing innocent people, when it has to do with dominating people, when it has to do with subordinating people, of course. We want to be morally consistent. We want to be spiritually consistent. And we are as much against Islamophobia as a phobia against anybody. Anti-Jewish hatred, we reject it. Anti-Arab hatred, we reject it. Anti-Palestinian hatred, we reject it. Anti-Black hatred, we reject it. Anti-Woman hatred, we reject it. Anti-White hatred, we reject it. We're morally consistent. We're standing in the legacy of my dear brother Martin Luther King Jr. when he said if we don't keep track of racism and poverty, if we don't keep track of materialism and militarism, we will slide down the slippery slope to chaos and in the end we either hang together or we hang separately. Oh, what a powerful word that was in 1967. And here we are 52 years later and the relevance becomes even more overwhelming. So yes, we stand at a moment in which we raise the best of our moral and spiritual selves, to put our bodies on the line, put our minds in the Socratic zone of deep questioning and commit ourselves to ensuring that we're willing to cultivate the courage and the fortitude of saying 
with our Yemenese brothers and sisters, we will do all we can on every front to ensure that their humanity is in no way violated. That the crimes against humanity taking place right now in Yemen, killing of the children, the drones that have been in place for a while, and let's be very honest about this, one of the reasons why it's difficult for the issue to surface was because this has been going on for a while. And it was very difficult with so-called democratic liberal presidents to bring critique to bear. And it was even very difficult for Brother Barack Obama, because when you got a black president, head of a white supremacist civilization, the brilliant, friendly, poised face of the American empire, it became even more difficult. But no, you got to tell the truth. 45 drones on the bush, crimes against humanity. 547 drones under Barack Obama, crimes against humanity. You got to be morally consistent and spiritually consistent too. Not the question of the color of the skin, it's the question of the quality of the compassion and the impact of the policies. And now under the gangster in the White House, Trump himself, where the expectations are so low, but he makes it very clear, don't look for me for moral and spiritual content. I'm in this for the survival of the slickest. I'm obsessed with the 11th commandment. I'm trying not to get caught. <laughs> So it becomes more blatant. He's taken off the veil. He speaks much more crudely about what motivates him in American policy. And in a certain sense, that provides a source of a broader awakening among Americans who have been sleepwalking for so long. We didn't know that our drones were killing all of these innocent people. Well, we should have known because they had denied killing any civilians whatsoever, but when they killed one American civilian, what happened? Barack Obama had a press conference that same day, apologized to the family, provided financial compensation for life, and we say, wait a minute, that American life is precious. His brother Warren was his name, but that American life has the same value as a life in Yemen, as a life in Pakistan, as a life in Afghanistan, as a life in Somalia, as a life across the board. Where is this special preference taking place? Don't violate the rich legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. and Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker. We here at Yale want to stand for light. We want to stand for truth. And so we end as a blues people. And blues is about what? Confronting catastrophe with creativity and with compassion. Confronting catastrophe with resilience, with joy in struggle. It's like B.B. King when he comes out on the stage with a little help from Lucille, his guitar. The first song he often sings is the B-side of the Pentagon. He says, nobody loves me but my mama and she might be jiving too. <laughs> that's catastrophe. But oh, that style. That smile, that resilience, that resistance, but it's got to be grounded in moral and spiritual manner. It's got to be tied to a systemic analysis of empire and predatory capitalism and patriarchy and homophobia and transphobia and white supremacy and anti-Jewish ideology and anti-Arab ideology. Do we have what it takes? That's always a question mark. But anytime we come together as we are doing right now and listen to the magnificent music the brother Hadi, he's in the same tradition as B.B. King. Dealing 
with catastrophe, with unbelievable creativity and compassion, unbelievable resilience and resistance. And we all stand together, no matter what color, no matter what gender, no matter what national identity, no matter what sexual orientation, we commit ourselves this day. In fact, it's a covenant that we make that we're gonna do all we can to fight the social misery of our brothers and sisters in Yemen and around the world. Thank you for being here tonight and let us remain fortified as we struggle. speech by Dr. West, as always. As we've heard, there's no excuse for bombing or starving a child, no matter where in the world that child may be. And yet we've seen that tens of thousands of time in Yemen, and we're gonna keep seeing it every single day. 100 children die in Yemen every single day for preventable causes. So we have to stand up, to speak out, especially when our US tax money goes to fund these atrocities abroad. We have to stand up, speak out, and we have to do something about it. Because this can't happen any longer. The status quo has to change. Now, please donate to our Doctors Without Borders fundraiser. Um, we're trying to reach our goal of $25,000 by the end of tonight. So you can go on that URL. And also, please go on fastforyemen.org and keep the solidarity movement building across the country. And now, to conclude our program, I'd like to invite Imam Umar Bajwa, Yale's Muslim chaplain, to lead a prayer for victims of violence and deprivation in Yemen and around the world, along with Dr. Cornel West. Thank you all again for coming out. Assalamualaikum and good evening, everyone. Uh, I am humbled to be standing here today with you in the presence of uh, Dr. West, um, who I um, read as an undergraduate 25 years ago and has uh, his written so many works, but Race Matters, when I read it as a freshman in sociology class, uh, really reframed so many things for me and it was a paradigm shift for me personally. So it's the first time I've met him in person, so I'm, for that I'm incredibly blessed. Uh, I've written out my prayer, I'll read my prayer and then I would invite Dr. West to close the evening. Um, one note, uh, the proper name of God, in Arabic is Allah, and in my prayer I will use them interchangeably. I'll say, I'll beseech God and I'll beseech Allah. Um, so, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful. Our God of many names, you are the source of all love, truth, and wisdom. We thank you and praise you for all of your blessings and bounty. As we gather here with wounded but resilient hearts, we ask you to heal us and we turn to you for guidance and mercy. O oh Allah, in these sad, perilous, and turbulent times, we beg you to bless us with strength, hope, and patient perseverance. O oh God, we witness suffering everywhere, in Yemen, in Palestine, in Mali, in Syria, in Somalia, in Afghanistan, in Mozambique, in Iraq, and in America. We see wounded hearts, broken bodies, and traumatized minds. O oh Allah, we beseech you to assuage the suffering of all those who are afflicted. Please grant them safety and security, and please grant them inner and outer peace. O oh God, heal all the pain of those who are sick and suffering. Heal their traumatized hearts, bodies, and minds. O oh God, you are the most merciful, and so we beg you to shower your mercy over the innocent people of Yemen and deliver them from evil. O oh God, you are the most merciful, and so we beg you to shower your mercy over the innocent people of Yemen and deliver them from evil. O oh God, you are the most merciful, and so we beg you to shower your mercy over the innocent people of Yemen and deliver them from evil. O oh Allah, we ask you to protect and strengthen our teacher, Dr. Cornell West, and we ask you to accept all of his efforts. O oh God, we ask you to protect and strengthen our teacher, Dr. Shireen al adaimi and we ask you to accept all her efforts. O oh Allah, we ask you to bless the work of our students and to bless the work of Doctors Without Borders. O oh God, ennoble us with beautiful character 
and with steadfastness upon the truth. O oh Allah, strengthen our hearts with certainty. Bless us with certainty of your mercy, of your love, of your compassion, and of your justice. Bless us with felicity in this world and the next. O oh God, help us to feed the hungry and to take care of the poor. Help us to defend the defenseless. Help us to shelter the shelterless. O oh Allah, save us from hearts that are not humble, from souls that are not satisfied, and from eyes that have forgotten how to cry. O oh God, we ask you to inspire us to be and bring shalom, to be and bring salam, to be and bring peace. Together in our many voices and faiths, let us say Amen. Amen. Dear God, I thank you for allowing me to stand here next to my dear brother, Iman Balfour, to stand alongside the brilliant and courageous students here at Yale, to salute each and every member of this congregation this moment, to understand that indifference to evil is more insidious than evil itself. To acknowledge that indifference is the one trait that makes the very angels weep. That sin is callousness to the suffering, especially of the least of these. And that some of the grand examples of Amos and Esther, my own beloved Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon him, of Buddha, of Martin Luther King Jr., of Ella Baker, of Fannie Lou Hamer, all of those who have shattered indifference and callousness and decided to stand straighten their backs up, think critically, act compassionately, never self-righteously, humbly, but with intense spiritual tenacity to follow thy will of letting justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Please look upon thy children, our brothers and sisters in Yemen, and let them know they are not alone, that we stand with them and we know that you do too. Amen.